kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to a divided return of the Star Wars In Review podcast. We're the only podcast that can give you both sides of a divisive issue for the greatest franchise in history and still remain friends afterwards. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, who has not assaulted anyone on Twitter or otherwise today that I know of. And of over here, it's Do my I own. most days? Uh, I don't, I don't know. even think I've been on my Twitter I account in two I don't, weeks. I don't, I don't want to like bring out all those <laughs> Over here, it's Maya Madrid. Who hasn't gotten on Twitter enough today in order to tell Luke how he was wrong about something. Every so often we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars, answer some questions that we got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Luke Neitzel, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. We're less than a week away from the World Cup, which is awesome. And, you know, this is our 20th show, which that's a pretty good number. I never thought we'd still be doing this. So to celebrate, I dressed as fancy as I could in my fluffiest pajama pants. They are uh, Stormtrooper pajama pants. Christmas Stormtrooper pajama pants. Right. I didn't know that the Empire uh, was Christian. And uh, that is interesting. Well, That's most, great. Most oppressive regimes are religious in nature. Oh, that's now you're just being nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Indiana Jones there. Now you're just being nasty. <laughs> um, for me, I uh, gave birth last Sunday, uh, starting at 3 in the morning. I felt uh, an intense pain, and for the next 11 hours, I was in labor with my kidney stone. Um, It was born at 2 in the the afternoon last Sunday, and I'm a little bit sad because I was going to bring it for you to see, but my wife told me not to. Which is a shame, because I love that type of stuff. I know, but I'm happy to report that all of my, the job, I got a new job. I'm done with the kidney stone. I can actually be a real person, which is very exciting for me. How does your wife, who's been through actual labor, like you trying to draw the comparison between your kidney stone and passing a physical human being through her body? Sure. Uh, She had had read that oftentimes it is more painful than childbirth. Mm. And um, I, I would also guess that your wife is significantly tougher than you. You're wrong. Oh, really? Yeah. No. You haven't seen the kidney stone. Oh, it's okay. massive. Uh, <laughs> after this experience a week ago, uh, I, my toughness factor has gone through the roof. I have gained a ton of respect for my wife um, as to how tough I was, how long it took me to take pain medicine, and how I refused to go to the doctor because I didn't want them to stick lasers up my wing. Nice. Yeah. So Look like you could rip the ears off a of Gundar. Huh, I feel like I could rip the ears off a of Gundar, too. Nice. Hey, let's talk about everybody's favorite topic, Solo, a Star Wars story. So, uh, not doing so well. In past episodes, you and I felt that no matter what, this movie was going to make money and was very likely to spawn one, if not several, spinoffs. And then the movie came, and no one except for you, me, and a couple of our friends seemed to go to it. The production problems of this movie have been discussed on this show ad nauseum, so I don't want to get too deep into that, but those problems balloon the budget and we are staring down the barrel of having the first Star Wars movie to officially lose money during a theatrical run. I have seen a ton of different articles on this topic. Some say it's going to lose between 50, some say it's, or between 50 and 80 million dollars. Advanced ticket sales don't matter. Brand doesn't matter. We are in the bizarro world now and nothing makes sense. We're going to get into the reasons why in just a second. But first, can you detail your love, level of surprise at how badly Solo has done? I'm surprised it's doing that bad. I said I thought that it wouldn't be the... I think I said it would be the second or second or third lowest grossing one, not the lowest grossing one. I guess when you think about some of the factors that went into this, it really shouldn't have been that surprising. But I think maybe I just misjudged the popularity of Solo as a character. I thought he would be enough on his own to draw people, and it looks like he isn't. I'm shocked. Um, I Advanced ticket sales were through the roof. And I'm not sure what to make of it. And so I want to go through and have us discuss discuss each of the 1,800 different reasons that have been put for why. I'm just kidding. It's not 1,800. It's uh, only six. So the first reason that I want to talk about is topic number one is people think it's a bad movie. Is How much of a factor do you think that is in the quality of the movie as far as how many people have gone to see it? Well, it it has bad word of mouth. And that stops people from going. And it stops people from going multiple times that may generally do that with Star Wars movies. I 
think that if this movie had come out and everyone had said it's amazing and you have to go see it, then it would have stronger follow up weekends than what it's had. But that that hasn't happened and people aren't having it, and that's goes to the movie. Now, neither of us think this is a bad movie. I really like it. You really like it. I thought it was fine, but I'm not telling any of my friends you have to go see this. And, you know, I look at people I've talked to who have said, well, I'll just wait to to rent this one who normally go see them. And then from my own standpoint, this is the first one that I won't see twice in the theater. I saw all the other ones since Disney acquired them all twice in the theater, but I've had no interest to it. I probably will be the first one I don't buy. Uh, It just... To just didn't generate that for me. Sure. So I think that plays a, a major factor, especially as we see the continued drop from week to week. For me, I I felt like it outdid what the general ex- general public expected. Like we thought that it was going to be, we were hoping that it was going to. Be, I, I was hoping that it was going to be good. You were hoping that it was going to be passable. Both of us were afraid it could be terrible, and it wasn't terrible. And so I, I think with the Star Wars brand, and considering it had you know an A minus in, in the Cinema Score. Uh, it had seventy percent uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Like you'd think it would be better, which is the worst in a score Star Wars has ever gotten. That's by true. The way. That is true because the prequels all got A's. Yeah. So. But as as we know, you don't value Cinescore. I don't. Metric, but I was trying to be nice but... to you because <laughs> this the theme of this show is trying to rebuild uh-huh. bridges between people yeah. and trying to be kind. And so I'm not yeah. going to just take the pot shots that but, I but normally I will, do. I will say that and I will I deflect think, the ones that you get. Sure. I think Cinescore. Is a, I think both Cinema Score and the Rotten Tomatoes uh, user ones are very flawed metrics, mm-hmm. and the Cinema Score is especially flawed because people are saying their first reactions; they haven't had time to process anything they think. And I think you're also it's face to face, so people probably want to say nicer things than they generally would unless they're really fired up about it. And you get the reverse problem, I think, on Rotten Tomatoes, where you have to create a login, physically go to the website, and really want to do it. So you get the people who just Pissed hate things on it. the internet who want to go hate things louder. True. Um, so I, I don't think either of those metrics factor into it more. At least for me personally, the Rotten Tomato critic score is the one that I take seriously when I'm thinking about just me, whether I'm going to see a movie or not. Sure, and that's still... I haven't looked recently, but last I saw, 71%. So, not great, but not bad. I mean, and, it's... And that fell in line with basically what I thought of the movie. Right, so. right. Uh, number two, some people are saying that the advertising campaign was bad. What are your thoughts about that? I, I think the overall marketing, and I think this is going to bleed into some, some of the other, the other topics right. you're going to talk about... But I, I think it was a short ramp up and it was boxed in by some other movies that had giant rollouts that distracted from it. So with its release date being when it was and not having a clear path that the other ones did, I, I think they did the same marketing strategy that they would have done in September as far as how many buys they would have done. This is completely speculative. I, sure. I have no numbers to back that up, but they did. That's normal for our show. Story it, about exactly. It. Uh, and it didn't have the clear runway that they normally have in December, and then it's really close to another Star Wars movie, so they had to wait to start everything until that movie was done. So I, I think the advertising, the amount of advertising they did seemed very small in comparison to what we've seen from other movies, even Rogue One, which was outside the saga. So that touches on some of the other ones, as you suspected, but what do you think about the quality of those things? The quality of the trailers, the quality of the... The cut-ups in the TV ads, the quality of what you saw online, the online... The actual things they produced, I think, were fine and as good as anything else I've I've seen. I don't... There was nothing I saw that jumped out at me and went, don't see this. In fact, there are some things I saw in there that covered up things that I ended up not liking in the movie. So, I, I don't think that just... There was an ad that jumped out at me and I said, I don't like this. Now, I also don't watch TV spots. I don't watch normal TV because I stream everything with a Roku. And I only watch the first two trailers of movies that come out and then I ignore it. So who knows? Maybe there was some stuff in there I just didn't see that's really bad. But I feel like I would have heard about it from you if there was something egregious. Yeah, I, there, there really wasn't. I mean, I, I, I think people that I talked to seem to really like the trailers. And the promotional stuff seemed really good. I mean, the artwork, once they got that whole thing figured out with the, uh, the copycat business that we talked about on the show a while back i thought you know the artwork looked cool i thought the trailers increased the level that people were excited to see it you know people were like well you know there's not a lot of solo in these things but chewy looks cool and lando looks cool and i think the 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 results were basically positive third thing and you kind of touched on this comes too close to the last jedi 
what are your thoughts on how the last year, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the last Jedi and the other way, but you talk about the spacing. How important is the spacing of a movie to come six months? Because Marvel does this all the time, right? Six months later, another movie comes out. doesn't hurt them. Why does it hurt Star Wars? Uh, I think there was just no time for anticipation with this one, and, and Marvel... I mean, some of those Marvel movies aren't going to make as much as Solo, but they were on a smaller budget, and they weren't the main Marvel movies. You know, if Avengers Infinity War had done this, obviously everyone would be jumping off of buildings. Uh, so I don't think that's straight apples to apples, but I think you have a... You know, you, you spend so much time ramping us up for these one movies, and then you have a movie come out, and then you just kind of have another one really quick after it. I think it just kills excitement. And I don't think it kills excitement for people like you and me. It kills excitement for people who casually enjoy star wars that want to go um they, they feel like they just saw one so they're not going to go so i think that it takes away from that person it doesn't i don't think any of the diehard fans are going no i'm not going to see it because it's too close to last jedi but i think you lose a lot of the casual people you may lose a lot of the parents who are going to a lot more movies at this time of year that you know they're because their kids are asking to well it's like i've already taken them to a infinity war and you know whatever other animated movies and things that are coming out. So it, I think it hurts it more from that aspect. I think too, I'm, I'm kind of with two minds on it because obviously the comparisons with Marvel are going to be there at the same company. It's another geek franchise that's done extremely well. And people can argue that Marvel doesn't have this problem, but Solo's issues have proven that Star Wars does not have their act together in the same way Marvel does. Is it a brand thing? Is the Marvel brand more important or more of a surefire hit than Star Wars? I think, Five years ago, four years ago, even last year, we may have said absolutely not that Star Wars is the bigger, more solid brand. Marvel makes big movies and small movies, and the small movies, like you said, they do what they're supposed to do, and sometimes they become Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Oppositely, Solo is one blemish on an otherwise pretty stellar record for the four movies that have come out. Now, granted, it's a bigger bomb than any Marvel movie that we've seen, even if it does make a little bit more, it's going to lose. Marvel behind. Studios movie. Yeah, correct, correct. So, I... You know, I, I think I think about that a lot. I'm a huge Marvel fan. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and I wonder a lot. Like, is the which brand is is better? Well, I think the other the other trade off of doing less movies and having more anticipation is that when one fails, you dwell on it more and it sticks out more. Whereas if you know Ant Man isn't the biggest movie in the world, that's okay because you have another one coming out in three months and people forget about it and move on. So I think that also covers wounds up slightly better. And I'm not calling Ant-Man a wound because I really like it, but it's the trade-off of having so many movies versus having few. I'm really worried now. Uh, we might need one of those hop-ins where we, where we cut the tape while we go check something because we have the technology, the internet. Can you tell me, as of today, what has made more money, Ant-Man or Solo? All right, let's hold on a sec. Actually, I'm not. Okay, so we looked it up, and Solo currently is at $160 million domestic. So it's it's going to finish slightly higher than that. Um, so we'll say it's going to be on par with Captain America, the first Avenger, which finished at 176. Okay, Ant-Man finished at 180 okay. domestic. Um, but some of the movies, Marvel movies, related Marvel movies, whether they're Marvel Studios or not, it's already ahead of is the original X-Men, but that was in 2000. Yep. X-Men Apocalypse. Wow, uh, okay, Apocalypse did that bad. Uh-huh. X-Men First Class. It has I a know higher... that that bit, yeah, I know that that movie did poorly, but I love that movie. For Marvel Studios, The Incredible Hulk, it is higher than, which is at 134. The Wolverine, it's higher than. And then you look at some of the kind of real bad, like, Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance. Punisher How much War better Zone. is it than Ghost Rider, uh, Spirit of Vengeance? 110 million more than okay. Ghost Rider, okay. Spirit of Vengeance. Oh, thank goodness. And uh, the original Ghost Rider was at 115. So... It's definitely a low end, but there are Marvel movies. Now, of Marvel Studios, it looks like the incre right now The Incredible Hulk is the only one it has passed, but it has a shot of getting ahead of uh, Captain America as well as maybe catching up to Ant-Man and Thor. Captain America comes out today with how much people love that character now. I wonder how it does. Yeah. Yeah, well, and everyone loves that whole universe right. so much more. Right. So. The next one we have is that this movie wasn't needed. That's one of the things that is very popular. We didn't need this movie. Well, I would say for me, it wasn't when they announced it, it wasn't something I went, yes, that's what I want. So I, it didn't excite me from that standpoint, but I thought it would excite 
people. Like, I thought I might be more in the minority because I don't want the characters we love and familiar. I'm not a massive nostalgia person. So I like going back to the universe, but give me all new stuff to get in all new directions. And they never thought that that's what they were trying to achieve. But I'm surprised that more people thought that than I would have anticipated. Yeah, first thing I'd say, no movie is needed. That's kind of a bullshit response. And Rogue One proved that you can make a Star Wars story, you can do it justice, and it can make a billion dollars. And so I don't buy this one at all. Though I don't think Solo is as good as Rogue One. I think it did its job. And there's something more here than just this wasn't a needed movie. I think that's kind of bullshit. Reason number but five, what, what do you say five. about that? And what do you say, though, to maybe rephrasing that into people aren't that interested in this character? As we maybe thought. See, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think it's about the character. I think if this scores, this is a movie that scores 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. If this movie doesn't have, it doesn't come out in May. If this movie, movie doesn't uh, come too close to Last Jedi, which would have it. If it had longer ramp up for the advertising, I think it maybe does better. And the, uh, the, the next one we kind of already talked about is the movie should have been released in December. You kind of already say this. We probably don't want to dwell on it. But people want to be outside this time of year. Marvel realized this when the Avengers came out. They came out with that movie in April. Okay? The Memorial Day weekend isn't what it used to be with that sort of thing. I have no idea why they stuck to this date. Why do they stick to this date? Because they thought it was going to be a powerhouse. And uh, this was... Obviously, they could have shifted it back, but the original plan was for Last Jedi to come out in May of... Was it May of last year? Or was it May of this year? Um because Last Jedi was supposed to be a May release, and they ended up moving that to a December release. I don't think the problem is people outside. I think it's it's competing for too many dollars. It has too Deadpool. much in front of it and behind it. You had Deadpool doing really well. Infinity War is still cleaning up. There's just a lot more movies coming out because kids are getting out of school, and this is when people drop the big movies on them. I mean, we're... Uh, but none of these movies do well. I mean, not, I mean, Deadpool does. I mean, none of the movies that come out Memorial Day and afterwards really do all that well. It was like the seventh highest grossing Memorial Day movie of all time. And that's what I don't understand. Like, if kids are getting out of school, I, I think there's just... I think people don't want to take their kids to movies at this time of year. I Well, all box office is bigger this time of year than it is in other parts of the year. So I don't think statistically that makes any sense. You could say that weekend isn't a great weekend, but I think they thought we're Star Wars. We can own any weekend that we want yeah not anymore yeah no they can't and it seems like they've learned that at least hopefully but the other problem is is then they have stuff coming up behind it as well that are going to dig into it where the force awakens and last jedi basically everyone evacuates the space around them for that entire month so you can win four weekends in a row because nothing is even attempting to challenge you and here you still have avengers and deadpool cleaning up but then you're bringing in things like Jurassic World, which is about to hit, and other big movie. You know, Incredibles isn't that far off. Like, Ocean's 8's going to chip into the casual Star Wars viewer as well, I would think. So you're having other competition come up against it, where those December movies were getting a whole month of just themselves, basically. I'd agree with you on the Deadpool, on the, the, the movies before, and Avengers, obviously. But they had a second weekend where nothing opened, and they still did jack shit. And so I, I, I don't think this is the huge... The hugest reason I think it, but is that time of year or is that the movie? I don't know, dude. See, I I I tend to think it's struggling. I think it's the movie. I think if that's why I'm asking you you, all these questions. Well, you, I mean, you just went through a list of if they had gotten a better score, if they'd done better advertising, it would have done better. I didn't like so now. Or (laughs) (laughs) oh, we're not talking about music. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. So to now go back and say, well, no, it's just because it's this month, no one can succeed in this month. I don't think is accurate. I think you have to put the blame on the movie. If they had, if they had accomplished what they set out to achieve from a an entertainment standpoint, I don't think the time of year matters. So the last one, and this is the one where a lot of people are patting themselves on the back, is the one where now there is a, a segment of the Star Wars fandom who is boycotting this movie, and they feel as if they've been successful in torpedoing this movie to blame Star Wars for everything under the sun. The people who didn't like The Last Jedi, people who don't like the fact that there's women in roles or people of color in roles, they're all taking their victory lap nowadays. What do you put into the effect that the boycotts and just the bullshit 
Nothing, because I just think it's 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 a small minority of people who can yell on the internet real loud. I don't put any stock into it, and I uh, frankly don't really even want to acknowledge it because I think it's such a minor, inconsequential thing. But because we have communication, people can pretend like they're important and involved, just like we're pretending we're important and involved with sure. our podcast. I think you're actually leaving out a bigger factor, which is how much of the bad publicity around the production made oh, yeah. people weary of this because i think that is a far bigger aspect than people on chat boards and twitter complaining about you know asian yeah. women having roles and things um you know pe people get weary when they hear directors get fired and everything's in chaos and you know whether it was fair or not i certainly don't think it was upon seeing the movie but that you know iron reich is really <coughs> bad at this that we're stealing promo art I mean, they mm -hmm. basically did a handbook of what you could do wrong publicity-wise. And then they delayed giving us everything because of The Last Jedi, which, in my opinion, because of The Last Jedi, which made people speculate that they were trying to hide and cover things up. I mean, I, I think it's it's more a, a factor of... it's. I mean, it's all these factors we've talked about rolled into one, but if you want me to pick one that I think is the biggest, it's just the bad word of mouth around the production. See, I don't think most people care about that. And thinking about it, because it obviously didn't occur to me, if you talk about most people don't actually have an effect or most people don't realize that people who aren't us don't understand the minutiae because they're not hitting solo a Star Wars story into Google every five seconds like I am, I don't think most people knew about the production problems, like the, the casual viewer. And so I don't think that that was the biggest or even a, a huge factor. Other movies like Rogue One had lots of rumors of production issues. It didn't blow up as spectacularly because uh, Gareth Edwards kind of played ball. But uh, people didn't care. And then they just came out with it. So, final question on this topic. One year from today, is Kathleen Kennedy still the, the, the head of Lucasfilm? Well, there's already rumors out now that she's getting ready to step down and resign. And right. that she might not be in that position by the end of the there's month. There's a lot of bullshit on the internet, though, man. Do you buy it? Do you uh, not buy it? I, well, I would think she has to be feeling the pressure from Disney to do this and if she doesn't do this then i guess she has her fallback of producing every steven spielberg movie that comes out which isn't the worst side gig in the world to have uh quite frankly if i'm her maybe i just want to take a step back and say this this hasn't gone well uh i i've i've well it hasn't gone well i mean she has the second the highest grossing domestic movie of all time that she produced uh the third highest international last jedi's in the top 10 uh rogue one made over a billion dollars so Rogue One did great. Only three hundred thousand or three hundred million less than Last Jedi. As big of a smash hit as Last Jedi was, Rogue One's right up there. Yeah. So for her to get painted as a failure, I think is probably incorrect. But if I'm her, I I might just want to move on to something else. So I'll say yeah. I'll I'll say she whether it's by her own choice or uh, Disney's gentle guiding touch. Uh, I I'm gonna say that a year from now she is not still here. I'm gonna say that she is. And I think it's because when you take a step back, it's just as you said. They have made a zillion dollars on movies that she has produced. Have things gotten away from her? Yeah. And maybe this is just me wanting things to be the case. But she's been successful. Mm -hmm. And I and I don't think because one bad movie, one bad situation. I don't think it's a bad movie. I don't think they've, they've put out a movie with the exception of The Last Jedi. But I can see why people like The Last Jedi. She's put out smash hits with the exception of this, and it wasn't a bad movie. There's other decisions that were made. So I'm going to say she still had, I'm going to say all the way through episode nine, and then she may want to step down. After and, that. and if episodes nine is enjoyable and makes money, which I'm again going to guess it will, then nobody remembers this or cares. Right. And it's the Incredible Hulk of. It, but but it, no, can we just say it's the Hulk? <laughs> because I like the Hulk. <laughs> Can we just... Sure. All right. The Hulk. Thanks. Ang Lee's the Hulk. Hey, this week, Kelly Marie Tran, who plays Rose Tico in The Last Jedi, left Instagram after being subjected to vile and continued harassment by people unhappy with Lucasfilm. A handful of idiots out there changed her character's Wikipedia entry with racist comments, started petitions on change.org, and attacked her personal accounts. Luke, this shit seems to be getting worse and worse. Is there any end to this ever? Or is this just the result of people feeling emboldened by the anonymity of the internet and ability to find like-minded individuals? Yeah, I mean, it's just it, the internet allows that protection and allows you to reach out and touch to people. And for for people who who use it to promote themselves, it can be a really fabulous tool because it's a way to reach fans that's free and, and broad. 
But then you have the flip side of it, which is that there's tons of horrible people out there that will say and do horrible things because that they would never say to your face because they know no one will find out who they are. And if you get them blocked, then they can just make a new email and a new account and, and log back in. So it's it's a shame and it's part of the age we're in now and you wish it didn't have to exist. But unfortunately, it's the reality of that. And I would understand 100% why any type of celebrity would choose not to use any of those services. And sometimes I am amazed that any of them do because it seems like it's probably worth less than you you gain from it even when people are trying to be positive i think it can be we you know we had an experience where my my young daughter made um a t-shirt of of her favorite athlete and we tweeted a picture of it and that athlete ended up seeing it and sent her and re- retweeted it and sent her an autographed jersey which was amazing right that's like a great thing well because i'm i'm i was tagged in it and uh, from the athlete, and you see all the responses people get, and it notifies you, the amount of grown adults that then start begging for a jersey, <laughs> you know, like writing in being like, but I'm a bigger fan, I would love you forever, why don't you send it to me? Like, I was, I mean, hundreds of them, hundreds upon hundreds of them, and I just sit there and go, oh my gosh, like, I don't, you know, like, how do you ever look at anything on any of your accounts? Because, you, you know, you're semi-famous, you're going to wake up to 6,000 notifications, and, you know, five... 5,999 of them are probably all batshit crazy. Fair enough. I have been thinking about this a lot today, and I actually wrote the second part, my feelings on it, after I wrote the question, because I write the question, and then I think about kind of how how I feel about the matter. And if you notice, well, first of all, here's what I want to say. The things that have happened to this poor lady are terrible. You can't blame her for taking a role in the, one of the most successful franchises in movie history, doing her absolute best, and by all accounts, doing a good job with what she had to deal with. The idea that, that people are going to make racist remarks or remarks because they didn't like one of her movies is absolutely stupid. The whole thing is just absolutely terrible. And then I started reading articles about it. And what I realized, I had to check myself a little bit. If you notice in this question, I refer to these people as idiots. And what I was thinking a lot about is one of my heroes is Martin Luther King. And back during the Civil Rights Movement, he didn't vilify other people. He tried to build bridges and explain things and, and, and come at things from, from an idea of hope. And the amount of name calling back and forth isn't, isn't helping. Like, yeah, this, this, I, this situation, which is obviously terrible. And then the response also gets lost in like the, the people who feel this way and who have done this or the people who just didn't like the last Jedi are now being called man babies and cry babies and stuff like that. And so it like feeds on itself. It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And it, it makes me kind of sad because no one is just talking about issues anymore. And this is, this is a bigger issue where it's not just Kelly Marie Tran and it's not just Star Wars. It's, it's on everything where we're just vilifying other people and it just compounds. And it makes us feel better to call people names, call them idiots like I just did. And it's, it's not the way, it, that doesn't change anybody's mind. If you talk down to somebody, they just fucking hate you. It's not going to help. And and that's why I don't know if it ever gets better. Sure, like, I think these people are terrible people. But there's also a segment of people who are being called names who have nothing to do with it. You remember the people who didn't like The Last Jedi? The, the director called them crybabies or man babies. Ryan Johnson this week called a bunch of people man babies. It's just, it's be, like hate begetting hate begetting hate begetting hate. And I just, at some point, I just hope enough is enough. You got no response to that? You're just sitting... I, it, was well, <laughs> it was well said. I already said my piece okay. on it. I don't... You know, I'm not going to try to extrapolate <laughs> just, on something you put out that The look seemed, that you were giving me was oh, just kind of like... No, I, I, what you said was well thought out. I, I don't have... I don't have any more nuance to add to to what you said. So I... Oh. As much as I love to hear myself talk, and I do love to hear myself talk... Uh, we all love to hear you talk. Exactly. Too. No, I, I, think, I think we're on the same page, and... All right, we better get to the email then. Hey, guys, if you're out there and you want to contact the show, we'd love, or I should say gals, too. See, I did it. 
Hey, everyone. 2018. Oh, God. Women can like our oh, podcast, God. too. Oh, not according to our statistics. Uh, <laughs> hey, everyone. If you're out there and you want to contact the show, we'd love to hear from you. And what you have to say, we can be reached at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com, or you can send us a message at kidsseriously at Luke underscore Neitzel or at Maya Madrid and fire off a question for everyone's favorite segment, emails that kids seriously got. By the way, it doesn't necessarily have to be an email. This week's question comes from Joy in Wisconsin. Joy writes, hey guys, if you had only one thing to change about Solo, a Star Wars story, what would it be and why? <laughs> You're going to get mad. That's fine. Say what you want. Oh, like uh, what you like. That's my wait. favorite. If we ever have t-shirts of the show, yeah? I want the first one to be like what you like. And I want the second one to be how do you feel about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, off the top of my head, I would... Uh, the first thing that jumped out at me was take out L3. Okay. Because I... I I found it horrific. To, not horrific. That's not a right word for it. I found it uh, nails on a chalkboard, and I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see the depths that you found in it. I just found it kind of aggravating. And when she spoiler alert, when she dies, I was happy, and that is not, not what the they were respect, going for right. in that moment. So that character was just a, a complete, a complete miss for me. Um, and I would have. We talked about it when we did our spoiler review, but I would have liked to have seen there be more of an establishment of that initial Han Chewy relationship and where that kind of lifelong bond is really rooted. Cause I don't, I got that they were fast friends, but I never got the, the life debt, the light, not even the life debt, but just the, like we're basically hetero life mate soulmates, you know, that I think of them as, I don't feel like we ever got that. True. I feel like you're the Chewbacca. If you look at us, like, I should be the Chewbacca, but I feel like in our relationship, you're the Chewbacca. Well, I haven't trimmed my beard down in a while, so... <laughs> um, for me, I, I just would be interested to see if it was a December. Just for my own... Oh, December that's a good one. Date. I just, just to see. I, I don't know if that's an issue. I don't know the answers to the questions that we asked in the first segment today, but just to see what would have happened, I think that would have been that, That's a me. really good one. I never would have thought of me to ask, but now I'm jealous that I didn't think of it because that would have been really interesting to see how much that would have affected things i I think it could only have helped yeah i agree that's why i said it hey (laughs) touche let's let's talk about the clone wars luke season one episode 18 the mystery of a thousand moons a single chance is a galaxy of hope Directed by Jesse Yeo, who has been part of my least favorite episodes of the series, and written by newcomer Brian Larson. Dr. Vindy's virus gets out, and despite the evil scientist's apprehension, Ahsoka and Padme come down with the sickness, and obi Ken travels to a haunted planet to save the day. Apprehension is a bad term. He was apprehended. He wasn't apprehensive. <laughs> He's the opposite of that. So, Luke, take it away! So this one opens up in the opening crawl as a recap of last episode, which took me a little by surprise in kind of a fun way because last episode felt really wrapped up. It wasn't a cliffhanger or anything, so you thought it was a one-off. But basically it picks up right where they left off. They're taking Vindy away. He's going to go stand trial for creating the virus again. End of the best city. Deed. Exactly. And they are going through that bunker still. And Ahsoka's down there, Padme's down there, Jar Jar's down there, a bunch of the clones, including Rex, are down there. And that little robot guy who was like there... looks like Danger Mouse. Does he look like Danger Mouse to you? Like I don't a... know what Danger Mouse looks like. The, 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 the insignia... No? The insignia for the techno dude Danger Mouse kind of looks like that oh, to me. Oh, so, okay. I well, I will say yes. Oh, good. Even though I don't know what that looks like. I always thought he looked like a kangaroo, even though he doesn't hop. Uh, but he, uh, he's, he's sneaking around there and he has got one vial left that he was going to try to, to hide in a bomb. And they realize all of a sudden he's got it. And what he does is he is able to break the vial and send the virus through. Now, Padme and Jar Jar are fine because they're in protective gear suits and we got to see some fun Jar Jar bumbling to try and find his helmet. But they are completely fine. Which is too bad. We were really kind of hoping Jar Jar would get it right away. Yeah, yeah I was really surprised. I, I thought he was going to die. Um, and I then keep hoping. I know it's not realistic, yeah, but I we, keep hoping. We know he's in the third movie, but whatever. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. So then, but the clone troopers in Ahsoka, basically it's a mist, a blue mist that's coming at them that they're running from. 
and there's a safe zone, and Ahsoka's kind of holding it open with the Force so all the clone troopers can jump through. And she is able in the last second to jump through and close the door, but as we see a little bit of that mist sneaks through... They are worried that they might be infected, and the bigger concern down there is the virus is completely released through this underground facility, which is completely sealed, so it can't get to Naboo, it can't kill the people on Naboo. But what the worry is, is there's still active battle droids down there, and the battle droids are going to do everything they can just to bust out of that facility, and if they are able to accomplish that, then they are going to send the virus everywhere and probably kill the population of Naboo. Now, obi Ken are not there. They have taken Vindy to the uh, the Capitol building. The yeah, there you go. In Naboo, where they try to get him to tell him about a cure, but he didn't create a cure and he doesn't know how to of make course, a cure. which is the best thing. Yeah. All these antidote movies where there's like, there's gotta be an antidote. Like, every episode yeah. of every 80s series... That, that dealt with this issue. There's always some antidote. Antidotes are bullcrap. If you are some super evil doctor scientist, you don't create an antidote. Yeah, especially this guy because right. he sees it as a living organism and that's why he created it. Not not that he's trying to use it as a weapon. He just thinks it's alive. And it also gives us one last moment for him to kind of cackle at us and twirl his mustache. Not that he has one, but he's, he's doing Wrong the cartoon tentacles. equivalent right. of twirling his mustache. Uh, so they find out, they know there is a root that can cure this disease and it is on the planet iago man that would have been great to have last episode yeah yeah wouldn't it have been that would have been something why weren't they working on that i don't know maybe last they episode. were yeah oh yeah, yeah. maybe that could play man now we're making excuses later. for it right yeah so <laughs> they decide and of course because padme is trapped down there because we need a reason for anakin to apparently care they need to go get this root from this planet and it's deep in separatist territory and they want to wait until they can get battle cruisers, but because of Padme, Anakin won't wait. So him and Obi Wan just go off to go get that. Now, meanwhile, down in that bunker, we have some pretty sweet fight sequences where Ahsoka realizes she's infected and the clone troopers are infected. So they're like, "We there's no reason to hide in the safe zone anymore. We're just going to go wipe out all the remaining droids to make sure they don't try to let the virus out. So they're going through the tunnels again, and it's a completely different lighting than last time where it was like a really bright orange. Now it's really dark, and you have this blue fog that's going through everything, and they're running down and just hacking things to pieces and, and chopping through them, and there's a couple destroyer droids, which are my favorite to watch them fight, even though Ahsoka took them out a little too easy, but Ahsoka's a total badass in this episode, so I'm kind of worth that that trade-off. Padme's mask ends up getting cracked because Jar Jar's an idiot and ends up getting ends up needing to be saved, so she saves him and gets her mask busted. So she gets the virus as well, and she ends up sending a communication to Anakin telling him, Hey, I'm gonna die, make sure nobody opens this, and he freaks out. And then they go on their side adventure to Iago, which they come into the atmosphere and there's a it's basically a junkyard of destroyed battleships that are there and no one really knows why they don't know much about this planet they land well the and, people know well yeah not it's droll no that well yeah exactly <laughs> but the people on the planet know but no one else really knows anything about this they land on the planet and there is a bunch of battle droids like 50 of them they got kind of weird markings on them and stuff and when Anakin jumps out, they just all in unison start being like, welcome, welcome to Iago. Iago. <laughs> and he just massacres 18 of them while they keep saying, welcome to Iago and not trying to fight him. And Obi-Wan's kind of like, what are you doing? Uh, and that is where they meet Jabba Hood, who is their master, who is a preteen, teenage, young teenage kid who lives on the planet. He's reprogrammed all these abandoned droids to be his servants, which is pretty good. Um, and there is a population down on this planet, and the planet basically says that no one can leave. It's cursed because Droll, the Phantom Ruler, just won't allow anyone to leave. And anytime a fighter pilot leaves, they immediately get blown up. And he's got a hologram of his friend flying out and being destroyed. And it explains all the debris out there. But first, they got to get the root before we worry about that. So they jump on the feet of a flying bat or something, and then they go down and fight a Venus flytrap for yeah, a few seconds? It looked like the thing that comes out of the tubes in Mario Brothers. No, like, it did look like that. It shoots a fireball. Right. Uh, so they, they dispatch that pretty quick, and they get the, the root to make the cure, but now they know they need to get off the planet. So they attempt to just fly out, and what they realize out there, um, it looks like a giant constellation to the people on the ground when it lights up, but really it's a giant laser grid that the Separatists have set up. So once something flies into atmosphere from the planet, but not 
back out. They back don't want out, to be leaving. Yeah. It it destroys whatever it is. So that's what's happening. They realize it and realize they can't deal with it. So they go back down to the planet. They talk I to just the realize something. They set this up because it has the root. Like the root is everywhere on this planet. Yeah. I did not get that while I was watching. I feel oh. really stupid right now. Why did I was like, why are they trying so hard to, to keep anybody from leaving? That's the reason. They're yeah. Developing a, I don't know why they didn't just stay there to help protect it. Well, maybe this, they figured that would do it in and of itself, right. so it doesn't matter. Uh, but down there, they talk to, to Jabo, and he's able to, he's an electrical genius, mechanical genius. He reprograms a bunch of the vulture droids, and basically they use the vulture droids to take out the laser grid. And then they're able to fly back and get the root in time, even though everyone seems like they should have died probably a while ago from the virus. And we get a real quick ending. We never really see them, how they can get the people out and still contain the virus or, or any, any of that. Of that right. Or make the cure or anything. They just they just fly back and everyone's healthy and fine. And, and the, the show wraps to an end. And I think we're done with this arc. Possibly. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe that little... Did we ever see what happened to that little droid? I don't recall. They may have murdered him after they went to get the vial, but the vial had already released. Hey, droids are like clones, okay? They have one purpose, and that's to die. That was one of the things that ticked me off about this, is one of the clones. The clones are dying, and then he's like, well, that's why we're made. One of the clone leaders, and it's like... You shouldn't accept it as much. I like it when they didn't... I like it when they were depressed about the fact that they were made to die. Right. I I have to say there is absolutely no reason that I can justify it, but I really like this one. (laughs) Really? I did. Uh, My my biggest disappointment, I thought Iago was awesome. Yeah. I love the whole concept of Iago, and my my disappointment was I think there could have been a whole episode that was just about them on Iago for whatever purpose and how they get off and what is drawl and and the mythology of the people that they buy into all this stuff. I thought that was really fun. The... It has the things I hate. It Padme again is just a tool to motivate Anakin to save her. But Ahsoka fighting down in those tunnels is really cool. I think visually this is a very good episode uh, from the standpoint. They do a lot of perspective shots. Like you're looking through the characters' eyes as they tackle situations, which I thought was kind of fun. And they've done it a couple times, but not a ton where I appreciate it every time they do it. So this episode's kind of stupid, but I had a lot of fun with it. I hated this episode. Did you? <laughs> yes, I rank it out of eighteen. I rank it sixteen. Oh, really? Yeah, I think ringing in my ears from two weeks ago was still the idea that every time we see Padme, she's going to be a damsel in distress, and yeah. it looked like at the beginning of this episode that she was going to pull out of it, and she was starting to, and then it was like completely, nope. yeah, and then she just fell right into it, and now she's bringing Ahsoka Tano with her because there is that cool scene, Ahsoka, where she's totally kicking butt. But that is for like 30 seconds. The rest of it, she's dying. Yeah. And it's more of like obi Ken going to save the ladies. And I think it would have been a much cooler episode if it had been Padme and Anakin or Obi-Wan and Ahsoka who had gone to it. Uh, yeah. I- it, Iago, Iago. It doesn't bother me with Ahsoka because they haven't routinely done this to Ahsoka. And Ahsoka's gotten multiple character arcs that show her depth and what she can do and how she contributes and how she's better than Anakin and Obi-Wan in a lot of ways. So for it to happen to her doesn't affect me in the way where I went, Oh great. Padme is here. So obviously she's going to get into trouble and Obi-Wan's or Anakin's going to have to, to save her. And I, I, I've told myself that I'm not going to gloss over it, even though it continually happens. Like we have to mention it each time because it's so infuriating that she has to be a victim. Um, and, but she, she's not in it that much, and the stuff that didn't have to do with that, I liked. And there, and like you said, there was a flash at the beginning where she's down in the tubes, and she's being the aggressor, taking out droids. And you're like, oh, maybe she this isn't is going to be this the victim. The time, right? But you're right. They immediately just made her sick and then made Anakin mad about it. And like, and like I said, I view it from the lens that now she's pulling Ahsoka into it. So it's a character that I like. Okay. like it would have been really cool. I want to see more Anakin and Padme together. Because you don't really see that enough in the movies, and you don't really see that enough in the show so far. And I think it would have been cool for them to go, and Ahsoka and Obi-Wan being the ones that were caught. And I actually forget a lot of the time that they're a married couple right. in this show, because they don't really act like it. And she's not in it that much, and they're never together when they are. They don't have any real joint arcs, it's just she's captured, and he's gonna go save her. Right. So how many pews you give it? I, I I give it three. Three pews. Yeah, I found it enjoyable to be, you know. And I, oh man, I really though wish they would just go back and make an Iago episode because I, I loved Maybe every they do. even everything about Jebu. If you wrote on paper and told me he's gonna be this kind of smart alecky kid who's yeah, a genius with him. robots, I'd right. be like, you gotta be kidding me. This is gonna be terrible. But I I enjoyed him as well. Like he was smart ass in kind of a realistic way, and it wasn't grating. Like 
it it was the way someone would act if they were in that situation. So I even in, enjoyed him. And even though I thought, you know, I, I remember them jumping on the bat things. I was like, this is dumb, but it's kind of fun dumb. Uh, same with fighting Venus flytraps. Like, it's dumb, but it's fun dumb. So I'm okay with it. I didn't like it. No. Let's I, go get, to, I get that. Let's go to other nerd <laughs> news. <laughs> I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, what's got you going this week? Did you ever listen to Crime Town, that podcast? No. Are you familiar with it? No. So Crime Town, I would recommend. It is a podcast. It's done by two journalists out in New York. And there's only been one season, but the premise is, is they take a city in America and they give you the history of, the, of their crime. So the first season is all about organized crime in Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. Which is really fascinating when they get into the details. And they, they're they real professional journalists. So they have... You know, live, you know, they have first person interviews with most of the main players. They have recordings and audios of interviews, police tapes, all these other things. So it's really detailed. You get to learn a lot about it. Season two should be coming soon, which is great. But what they released is a secondary podcast. They released one episode of, and it's called the RFK tapes. And it's along with the, the 50th anniversary of RFK being assassinated. And it is about the conspiracy theories that follow that assassination which should be the most open and shut assassination that we've seen of a major american politician uh and i listened to the first episode because they released the Except first for the episode. john wilkes booth one i mean when you jump out That's... of the balcony and land on the stage and be like the yeah. south will rise again and told <laughs> everyone you were going to do it beforehand right uh but there are still conspiracy theories that he escaped and all that other stuff right but it's 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 one of those where they 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 go through what the conspiracy theories are about it, and they just they just tease one basically at the end of the episode because the, the episode's really kind of giving you more the background on the assassination, the logistics, the day of that that type of thing. And then when they go in there, it's it's so crazy what the actual theory they're starting out with is that I'm like I I don't even care. I have to hear how people can rationalize this because it's it's so insane. So I am really looking forward to that. So that's that's called the RFA uh, RF. Ugh rfk tapes okay i will definitely look into that i am right now uh listening to the first season of criminology where they get into a deep dive into the zodiac killer oh nice i do 12 episodes on that and so uh i'm i think halfway done with it and then they're gonna do um the ons after that they have done it and so i'm gonna leave and then come back for that i'm gonna if that's Um, called criminology i haven't heard of that yeah it's it's good i mean uh, it's it's very good but that's not what i want to talk about okay with the other near news because this wouldn't be a uh, star wars in review podcast with a little update without a little update from our chicago fire i wanted to get your opinions on what's going on with the chicago fire for those of you who do not follow mls or our favorite team they just kicked out an entire section of fans known as Sector Latino. And uh, and the Banter Buddies, because they're joint over there. I, I didn't know. That's that another supporter group. Okay, so um, they've been removed, and I really didn't... Till August 1st. Oh, is that the new one? Okay, because it was in, indefinite uh, last time. What happened, and how do you feel about it? So, if you, if you just read on Twitter today, you will, you will get the impression... That they were all banned because one person lit a gas station smoke bomb. Yes, that is what I'm there. Getting, right. Uh, if you if you actually read the letter as to why they're being that that is the the final straw incident, but it's not quite as black or white. Now, Sector Latino sit there. They have two kind of main supporter sections at Toyota Park. One is Section Eight, which is in what's called the Harlem end behind one goal, and then in the corner kick area of the other of the opposite goal is where Sector Latino sit and the the Banter Buddies, which is a smaller group that sits over there with them. And the Sector Latino is, in my opinion, the far more entertaining. They have They're drums awesome. and horns, and they they sing and and they do all those things, and they have better chance and and better energy than Section Eight. And Section Eight is not really one group; it's a bunch of like tiny groups and then just independent people that kind of come together under one banner. But there isn't like a lot of unity or recruiting or building. And compared to other major league soccer teams, it's actually kind of a very small, uncreative showing, in my opinion, um, and unwelcoming as well, even to fire fans that want to to be a part of it i've sat in supporter sections of other teams and everyone talks to you and it's like hey what are you doing here we've never seen you like you should be a part of this and you sit in section eights and they go oh you're not an original one of us like you know you (laughs) get out stand right in front of me yeah see i've had that happen. it's not a very welcoming environment which is why they have part of the reason in my opinion they have very bad numbers the team's also very bad which helps as well but 
Sucked your Latino as entertaining as they have the been and how much better atmosphere they provide for fans have done a lot of other things that have led them to this point. Um, there has been multiple instances of uh, homophobic slurs during goal kicks that have come from their section. There, uh, th- I think I think it was the home opener against Kansas City. There was a delay in the game and almost repercussions because they kept throwing garbage at the other team taking uh, corner kicks. And then uh, they they were already under sanctions from the team for a fight break like fights breaking out in their section. So at the like I was there for the San Jose game a week ago, and they weren't allowed to have like banners and music like that was their punishment. And then their response in that game was to light off a smoke bomb. Now whether that was a planned thing or it was just some idiot who did it, it's. They did a bunch of things, and now this is the result. So anyone that tells you one guy walked in with, like, they were getting along perfectly and behaving great, and then one guy walked in with a smoke bomb, and now they're kicked out, that is not true. But the ownership group, I think, has been very transparent in how little they care for that supporters group and how much they would be happy to get rid of them. So I think they jumped on an instance of being able to punish them severely, and they took it. So I don't know if the punishment really fits the crime. I think it is a lot more gray issue than I think either side would like to admit. And I am completely fascinated by it as a season ticket holder who doesn't sit in either supporter section, who sits in between them and just kind of watches them and generally enjoys what they do. Even if I wish we were more like maybe some other teams that have a little bit better support. But I'm fascinated because now... Section 8 is going to also boycott games until Sector Latino is let back in. And I'm, I'm curious to see, first, what that looks like. Because you have all these little supporter groups within Section 8, and they're the ones who are like, yeah, we're not coming. But you still have all those independent people who just buy tickets and show up in that section who haven't really been included. No, you mean As, like I was. Like, like you like were, when you right. had season tickets in Section 8. And so the, I think those people might still show up. So I don't know how much this is going to affect their numbers, which is going to be a massive ego crush to, to Section 8. They did this type of thing a while ago where they, they boycotted. I don't even remember what they were boycotting. Oh, it was just sucking. It wasn't just No, be... there, was, there was something like they didn't have capitals. I don't remember what it was. There was something they were fighting about. It might have been the editorial. But for whatever reason, they were, they, they were out there having a 90-minute tailgate to protest. And then the, their section basically looked almost as full as it normally does, which is half full um and so then they started claiming that like they had ushered people in there to make it look full and tried to do group on sales and all these things to sell their seats so that they could get people there and i don't think that's the case i think it's they're just not a group that ever worked to unify people so now that they need everyone to be unified to help support them i'm really curious to see if that works and then i'm also curious is everyone's perceived value because i think section eight sector latino have a very high value in their head of what they bring and i don't think ownership has a very low opinion of their value and what they bring and i think the common fan is somewhere in the middle as to what they bring so it's a real like smashing of egos that as a bystander on the side i am just completely fascinated with but it made me laugh because we have talked about doing just a soul soccer show and stuff like that in the past and i think that would be really fun and i've always thought what a cool idea it would be as a segment of that show to pull out the funny things that go on on the hashtag for the fire and talk about them and all that. And between this and between the controversies with Hot Time in the Old Town and what happened, Alan Gordon. We'll, we'll talk about that, yeah. Yeah, and some of that. The hashtag is a place I basically want nothing to do with. <laughs> like, I'm just... I wander on there and I'm like, oh, it's scary. <laughs> That's why I think it's awesome. I think, yeah. I think, I think it'd be fun. Uh, part of what we do here is conspiracy. We do analysis that maybe sort of touches on the conspiracy. We talked a little bit about conspiracies today with the, the RFK. How much of this is kicking out a group right before Pride Night, which is tomorrow night? It'll have already happened by the time that this airs. But it's Pride Night on Saturday. And you had said that they have been accused in that section of homophobic slurs. Do you think that has anything to do with it? I, I don't think okay. so. Um, I think they could use that to fall back on. And I think it, I think if that was the case, I think the fire would be up front and say that. Mm-hmm. And use it as a shield, even if it wasn't true. And I, I will say that I don't think I've heard that this year. 
there. I've been to four games this year. You went to one with yep. me. I don't think we, we heard it at all. No. Last we year, kind of close. What, did we sit we sit halfway or? between them and, okay. and Sec 8, but you can generally hear Sector Latino better than Sec oh, 8 yeah. from where we are. It was a big problem last year. And it, it's interesting because I, I've been reading on Twitter and a lot of people make comments about how they brought non-soccer fans to games. And one of the things they comment on is how cool the fan supporter sections are, which is true. But I last year brought my cousin and his young son to their first ever soccer game. And that chant was ringing out loud every single time. And I had to explain to him what that was and why I was getting pissed off about it. And he was like, I don't really want to bring my kid to that and explain that to my kid. So as much as they can bring atmosphere, fans in general, um, they, they can also hurt it as well and give bad impressions when they do things like that. Now, the one thing I'll say is, is that that chant, it, it, they have been accused of originating that chant or of being involved in that chant. When I was at games last year hearing it, it wasn't just them. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had a lot of fans last year because we were good and Schweinsteiger came in. So there were a lot of new people. So I'm hoping that that was kind of the case and those people have been weeded out, but uh, that's, it's unacceptable. And what do you think the chances are that the fire take this opportunity to just ban their relationships with sector eight and, or um, section eight and sector Latino and just start new supporter sections. Like I look at, we went to the first ever Loon's game, Loon's home game, mm-hmm. and their their supporter sections were filled. They looked really cool. They seemed to have a really cool following on Twitter. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I'm kind of just on the outside. I'm not a huge Loon's guy. Uh, but, I mean, I could see the team just saying, all right, screw you guys. You guys are banned, and we'll just start new ones. Well, that that's a different scenario because the, the Loon's – that we went to their first MLS game. Yeah. So that, our, yeah. that, that supporter section has been around – I mean, the reason they're called the Dark Clouds is because they formed to support the Minnesota Thunder – which don't even exist anymore. So that that supporters culture has been around for a long, long time. It's just they moved to a different league. So they, they came with it. I don't think that they are going to just straight ban every one possible. And, and let's also be clear, too, that um, my understanding from what I've read is that banning Sector Latino and Banter Buddies is 100 people. So let, it, it's not 5,000. Um, it's not Seattle banning its supporters section of 30,000. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit different scenario. But, you know, there is this new Ricketts USL team coming, and I think there's a big wave of people who would love the excuse to use that to get out and go move their supporter group over to the USL team um, and all that. And I honestly think that the demise and rebuild of Section 8, if it happens organically, could be a really great thing for the team and for the fans. Because if you're if you're that angry a member of the group and – the fire aren't bringing you fun and enjoyment, then you then move on. Like just, just get out. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to go through that if that's not what you want to do and go enjoy the USL team and have fun with it. And in the same standpoint, I would love to see one unified supporter section that grows out of that, that is welcoming and inclusive of people. Because as we've talked about, this isn't a sec that you know, because they're all these little groups and they're basically just friends who make groups it's competition and infighting among those groups constantly and bickering and childishness. It isn't uh we're trying to grow. We're trying to be big. We're trying to be one of the biggest things. I mean, I've been to games where they couldn't even raise their TFO to the top because they don't have enough people well, that, to I, do it. I don't think I've been to a game where they've been able to raise their TFO to the top. Yeah. So I, I think starting over and getting new people who have enthusiasm and excitement and are jaded and burned out and, and all those things and are wanting to grow it would be a great thing. But I don't think that can be a thing that the club initiates. Like, it just it has to happen on its own. So we'll see if that's the case. But, you know, they started out with the Barn Burners were their supporters group. And for whatever reason, that fell apart. And then Sec 8 rose after that. So maybe we're in into that cycle and if the, if that's what the USL team brings then I'm I'm fine with that. Well, speaking of fine with that, I'm fine with the end of the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Luke Neitzel, where can they find you? They can I guess kind of find me on Twitter. Yeah, if you bother to check it. Uh yeah, I think it's been 2 weeks or so, but um maybe I'll try and do that this weekend. It's at Luke underscore Neitzel, N E I T Z E L. I just get excited when I turn it on and there's like 34 uh notifications but like they're all just kids seriously telling me that 
they tagged me when they uploaded the newest show and then like 90 people being like i liked this tweet not not one of my tweets right. just like they liked it so ryan yeah. johnson liked this tweet from jim carrey so we put it in your timeline because we thought you'd want to know <laughs> For me, I check it much more often. I am at Maya Madrid. Together, we are at Kids Seriously, and together, we are out of here. We remain undivided, united, and strong. Bye. Thank you for listening to Kids Seriously. This episode was recorded and produced at Camro Studios. Visit our website at www.kidsseriously.wordpress.com or email us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Until next time.